Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Take your seats. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to see so many of you here on a Friday evening. It's not the most uh, enjoyable and uh, uh, happy topic to discuss on a Friday evening, but I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting session. My name is Benedicte Bull. I'm the leader of the Norwegian Network for Latin America Research at the University of Oslo. I am very, very pleased to have with me today three persons that have great knowledge about the current situation in Mexico, the background for what is going on right now, and uh, possibly some very well informed um, opinions at least about what will go to happen next. Those are uh, to uh, the right, Tanalis Padilla. She is a historian. She is uh, working at the University of Dartmouth in the United States, now at the College, University College of London. That's where we bring her from here. She uh, has uh, worked for many years on social movements in the southwestern part of Mexico, uh, Guerrero particularly, and now she is writing a book on the, the history of the uh, Normales Rurales, the rural uh, no, teacher schools in Mexico. Then we have Edgardo Boscaglia. He is a senior uh, scholar of uh, law at the Law School of University of Colombia. He is also the head of an organization in Mexico that is helping the victims of organized crime and he has uh, part-time positions in a number of universities across the world, mostly in countries where uh, there is a severe problem of organized crime, including Argentina and Lebanon. I also have here with me Carlos Flores, who is a political scientist. He works at the Center for High Study, Studies of Social Anthropology in, uh, in Mexico de FN, CSS, and he is um, He's the author of two books on the connections between organized crime and politics in Mexico, one on Tamaulipas and one comparative study between Mexico and Colombia. The reason why we organized this event, uh, the background why these people are here, is that it's actually a research project. But we took the opportunity of them being here uh, to organize a public event because of a tragedy occurring in late September in the, in the town of Iguala in the state of Guerrero, where 20, 43 students uh, were uh, abducted after three of them were killed. And I am sure that most of you that are here know a little bit of what has happened afterwards, that after many, many years of severe violence, killings, kidnappings, uh, Mexican peoples have, people have taken to the streets. And uh, there is a, a sense of rage in Mexico that we haven't observed in at least very many years. In order to give you a bit of a sense of what has been uh, going on, uh, we have asked uh, Daniel Munoz, who's a Spanish photographer, uh, now residing in Cuba, to uh, put together a few images for us that we'll show before we start the conversation.
Yo estoy seguro de que sure the intention of the police wants to take our lives. The rules of the games were inverted. Before, there was organized crimes that was managed by a pyramidal state of command and control with a single party. Now, every criminal group has taken control of every bit of the Mexican state, where it's like a puzzle. Each piece belongs to a different criminal group. These criminal groups are increasingly competing fiercely among each other for the capture of that state. We are at the crossroad, as the subcommandante Marco said, rightly said. When a tiger is cornered, he doesn't run away, he fights. And that's exactly what they're trying to do to us. They've cornered us. And you? Are you going to fight? We're going to fight. We will not give up any instance of communication, approach, and openness to avoid the use of force and restore order. Let the people that came in a bit late to find a seat. There's seats over here and over there, so just move in. I hope those images gave you a little bit of the feeling. We've seen a lot of the images in the media over the last uh, weeks, uh, not least yesterday, when there were new large uh, demonstrations in Mexico. And we hope that the conversation that we will have today will shed a bit of light on what is actually going on in Mexico and what we can expect in the future. I would ask, uh, like to ask by starting so to open up by asking the three people here some questions uh, um, related to their area of expertise and we'll soon bring in the audience. You can just raise your hand and I'll try to, uh, if there's questions that relate to the, uh, to the, question, the issues that we are discussing. But I would like to start with Tanaris, because she is an expert on uh, these uh, rural students. And it is quite incomprehensible for us, uh, those of us that live in a very different context, of why um, politicians and police, with the probable uh, knowledge of um, the military, why they should abduct a group of 43 students, um, so, could you, as a beginning, try to give us a picture of what kind of uh, students were these and what do you think could have happened? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, these, these schools are known in Mexico as normales rurales or rural normales, uh, schools that train um, students to be teachers. And the, the rural normales are, have a very special significance that date back 
to the Mexican uh, Revolution and represent one of the social gains of the project brought about by that revolution. These schools were created in the 1920s but really took shape and form in the 1930s under the presidency of Lázaro Cárdenas, who was committed to implementing many social reforms, and made these schools really give them the framework of what they are today, which were schools for the sons and daughters of campesinos, of peasants, to study, to get an education, to become teachers, and as a way of escaping poverty. And for various reasons, which I can get into uh, later if, if there's interest, the students at these schools have a, a, a very strong uh, sense of political consciousness or develop a strong sense of political consciousness and, and of dignity and of struggle. So, so they're known throughout Mexico to be uh, politically conscious students and they're also maligned for that reason by the press, by the mainstream. Um, they're maligned as being agitators um, and, and subversives. Um, and and the, the students themselves tend to be from very humble backgrounds, often indigenous. Uh, Mexico is no longer a predominantly rural society, but still the students here that, that come to these schools come from, from poor backgrounds. The, the structure of these schools has changed a bit over time. In the 1950s and 60s, students um, started school uh, after sixth grade, so they were fairly young, and they, were, they studied their, their boarding schools. They got room and board there, a modest scholarship, and a guarantee of a teaching position thereafter. Through Because of several reforms, now they're, they're college, so students start after um, high school. But they're really significant for the political landscape of Mexico. And just finally, like I said, they've often been maligned for their political consciousness. And um, while at their height, they numbered 36 and were spread throughout the country, in 1969, President Diaz Ordaz, infamous for sending a massacre, uh, for the massacre of Tatelolco in 1968, closed almost half of them. Today only 16 persist and, and, and the reason they do has been thanks to the struggle of students who've maintained them and also helped create a, a couple of new ones since then. These students uh, were protesting the day they, they were first shot at by the police and then abducted. Could you just tell us a little bit more about what was the protests about and this is this any of any relevance to the fact that they were uh, kidnapped? Um, the students, like I said, these institutions um, have not only been maligned, but have been very abandoned in terms of resources that they should be entitled to. So the only way they survive, the only way students often get the food rations they're entitled to, the scholarships they're entitled to, the teaching positions they're entitled to, is by mounting some sort of protest. And these protests take various forms. Uh, you know, the, 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 the people, the, the poor, don't have a lot of recourses. Many of the tactics they use are blocking roads, taking toll booths, mounting strikes, taking over buses, which is called uh, sequestering, or they use the word kidnapping buses. It doesn't mean they get on the bus with guns. They, they get in and they, and they tell the driver, take us here, which is what, what happened on that night. They were going to Iguala to collect funds or to, um, to do boteo, which is, you know, ask people for donations to attend the, the commemoration of the 19, uh, of the march, uh, the march of the commemoration of the 1968 Latelolco massacre. So this is what they were doing and going to, to Iwala on buses that they had taken over when, when they were shot at. Could you just, I'm sure a lot of you have already gotten, gotten this from the press, but could you just tell us a little bit more about what happened afterwards? Yeah, so um, uh, as the, 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 the version, the most accepted version right now is that um, the mayor of Iwala, who was celebrating uh, with his wife, um, a, um, where she, she was, uh, they were having a party in terms of uh, her giving um, some information of this organization she's heading, and she's also, uh, putting herself as the, as the pro, as was hoping to put herself as the next mayor. Um, so, so what it appears to have been happening is that the mayor ordered the, the municipal police to, to stop these students from maybe ruining the festivities that they were having. And so the police um, shot at, at the students um, and took, uh, captured several of them, the, the 43 that are missing, and seemed to have turned them over to an organized a group called uh, Guerreros Unidos. And since then, um, 
they have not been heard of. In the process, um, they killed uh, three normalistas and, and three other people. One of them, one of their bodies, one of the bodies of these normalistas, of the, of the students, was found um, with his eyes gouged out and his, his face peeled off, which is a classic um, tactic of, of organized crime. So here you really see the, the links or the overlap between uh, the state, the municipal police, and uh, organized crime. You're talking about the massacre in Tlatelaya in 1968, but how, uh, it's not common, but has the, anything like this happened before in Mexico? What's, what's really um, interesting about, about this case is actually, I mean, it, in some, in that, that in some ways it, it's not at all different. I mean, from the, the violence that has been, uh, that has characterized the, the militarized war on drugs in Mexico that Calderón declared in 2006. So um, since then there have been um, about 80,000 people killed and 20,000 disappeared, um, massacres, mass graves found. So in that sense, this, this uh, kidnapping or disappearance of, of students is, is not unique. What has been incredibly unique or, or different is the extent of public outrage nationally, which has been really significant in developing outrage um, internationally as well. But considering that there are, as you say, lots of other cases of massacre of, of mass graves found across the country, uh, how can you explain this public outcry that we see now? Uh, I, I've honestly I've been asking myself that same question since since it happens, and I'm afraid I don't have a, a good answer. I have some thoughts, and um, partly partly it's do, it's just hard for social scientists in general to uh, to always pinpoint at at what what is going to you know really be the tipping point, right? And so to a certain extent, after it, the incredible amount of violence that has happened and the incredible situation of impunity, of corruption, of the fact that, um, that, that a lot of people had warned that the war on drugs was not about just killing criminals, that social activists were being targeted and that the government was intimately involved in this. At some point there comes a tipping point and it seems to be that this has been the tipping point. Why, why this? At one level it could be just simply fed up, it was one massacre too many. But I think that it also has to do very significantly with the fact that there were students. Uh, these, were, these, were, these were students, they were clearly not involved and had no links uh, to organized crime. And so it really struck a chord, struck a nerve with the Mexican population who is, is conscious of the fact that, that the government has historically repressed students. I mean, in, in 68, the massacre at Tlatelolco is, 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 um, is very present in the minds uh, of many now. So I think to that extent, I, 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 as someone who studies these schools and knows how significant they are for how they have preserved the social reforms born of the revolution, and they have preserved them despite decades, decades, decades of, of undoing them by the PRI, by the party that has ruled Mexico, that ruled Mexico for 70 years, was out for 12 years and returned with, with Peña Nieto. Um, and they're the, some of the last um, institutions that preserve some of these ideals. I want to believe that it has something to do with that, but I'm not entirely sure that at the national level that's why they, they've reverberated, especially since these students have often been maligned by the press for their precise activism. However, I do think that the fact that they are politically conscious and when this happened, did what they know how to do best, which is fight, continue struggle, as, as a young man in the video said, you, you know, we're not gonna take this line down. And so mobilized the political net networks, they organized, they're politically conscious, they were demanding, their families were demanding the return of those 43 students, I'm not sure that with other massacres, that the immigrants, for example, you had a, a group of, of, of people and of students demanding that, this, the, that, that they be returned. So I think that could be a factor in how they, get, they, they, um, they got going. Thank you. I'll turn to you, to Carlos. Uh, this case has revealed for everybody, the very close links between the mayor and organized crime, also up to the level of the governor. Um, you have researched linkages between 
politicians and, and organized crime in other parts of Mexico. Do you think this, uh, the president went a long way to, to sort of point this out as a local problem, it is Guerrero, but do you think this could have happened anywhere in Mexico or is Guerrero a special case? Thank you, Benedicte. I, I would say that, no, it not only happens in Guerrero. It's a, there's a continuity in terms of this kind of violence present uh, in states in, like the Molipa, like Michoacán, like Jalisco, like Sinaloa. Almost every corner of the country may have this kind of violence because this uh, tradition of protection, uh, political protection of organized crime was deeply rooted in the Mexican institutions. This is not a new issue. Um, what you see here in this case is that uh, what is uh, um, uh, rather uh, new is that he's now targeting not um, criminals, not police officials, but students. And there is a harsh memory in Mexico because we have a, a tradition of a repressive authoritarian state. And this kind of people have been also involved in, uh, in uh, repressing students, repressing youth, have also been, uh, according to historical evidence, also involved in protecting drug trafficking. Um, it is a, 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 an attempt to lower the level of attention, of international attention, that this problem has when the Mexican president says that it's only a local issue. You, uh, as a matter of fact, could immediately consider, for instance, the Mexican institutions, some of the security institutions in Mexico have acknowledged that they knew about these links of uh, Mayor Abarca, Mayor Abarca, with organized crime. The big question is why they didn't anything before. They had information that linked him with, uh, directly with a murder, and they uh, didn't even uh, continue the investigation. I think that uh, it, th this kind of crime, this kind of, uh, of uh, paramount relation between organized crime and politics in this level could not happen actually without, no without knowledge of bigger institutions like the army, like the Minister of Interior, like federal police. The big question is why, why didn't pro uh, protect the students when this massacre was happening and why they didn't investigate what was necessary to dismantle before this uh, criminal ring, before this kind of uh, massacre happened. How would you, we've seen some examples of linkages between politicians and, uh, and organized crime, or maybe even better to say that it's hard to distinguish between them, but what would you see, say are the main uh, features of those linkages uh, in Mexico in general? Well, we had two models. Before the uh, transition in power, before a, a, an opposition's party became elected in the federal level, what you usually had was a sort of pyramid in, in which politicians were able to control for the institutions, the security institutions, and which used the uh, security uh, officials as intermediaries between organized crime and themselves. Uh, security officials uh, repressed even organized crime, but as well uh, were able to uh, um, provide the money that this illicit activity uh, uh, produced and handle them uh, to, the, to the politicians. Nevertheless, after this uh, uh, supposed transition, I, may, I must insist that it's not actually a transition to democracy because we don't have a functioning democracy in Mexico. This, this corruption has not disappeared, it just fragmented. And now you have different groups, different uh, 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 sets of interests between uh, camarillas, political camarillas and organized crime groups clashing each other because sometimes they are pursuing the same interests and competing for them. Um, uh, the state seems unwilling to uh, prosecute them because many times the, 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 the higher level of government might also be involved in this kind of interests. Yeah, you said something about it, about the, how the linkages have changed over a longer history. Would you say that it has, they have changed also with the change from the last government to the, to the current government? Now that the, the uh, PRI is back in power, do you think that is a shift in the linkages or is this a longer historical process? 
It's a long historical process, but nevertheless, when uh, new people are uh, elected, it means that sometimes they may have interests with different groups. Um, in this clash of interests that, that you may see, for instance, it's very likely that last um, government, some, some actors, not probably the whole government, but some actors within the last government have uh, more uh, links with a specific group than the current ones. But nevertheless, at the end, Mexican society loses with everybody because you are not considering here in this case to build a, a, a rule of law, a functional state. They are mostly competing with each other for the, for the um, uh, acquirement of irregular uh, wealth. Thank you. To you, Elgato. You have, uh, for many years, warned that something like this could happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have argued that uh, more about two-thirds of all municipalities ha are infiltrated by organized crime. And this conclusion is based on, based on thorough studies in Mexico, but also international comparisons. Can you just tell us a little bit more about those studies that are behind that, uh, that figure? Yeah, thank you, Benedict. The, the main uh, premise that we have to understand in Mexico is that Mexican organized crime behaves uh, differently from Norwegian organized crime. Be and, and you do have organized crime in Norway, of course. Uh, because in uh, Mexico you have too many criminals in charge of different portions of the state. And those criminals in charge of portions of the state do not cooperate with each other very well. Now, in the old days, when Carlos was talking about before, the criminals that you had in 68 did cooperate quite well. You had a command and control system in the old days with the Partido Único, with the only party that took power for 70 years. So you had a command and control, and crimes were committed. Politicians were made rich. This is a proven fact. There are many books written about this. This is not my statement. I mean, you have Carlos, who proved that in his book about Tamaulipas. You have Luis, who proved that on Sinaloa. You have a library of books proving how presidents and ministers became incredibly rich by links to organized crime. So this is not a, an opinion a subjective opinion. This is a proven fact by scientists. Now, during the transition uh, in the past 15 years, those command and control systems that the PRI used to have collapsed. So every single little mayor of a municipal government became a feudal lord, became independent for the purposes of making money doing the same things they used to do 40 years ago, but now they do it in a very uncoordinated way. When that happens, uh, usually organized crime competes among themselves to capture those pieces of the state, like piranhas, you know, those fish we meet. They compete in a random, violent, corrupt way. And this is where Mexico is right now. Now, what we did, when I arrived in Mexico in 2003 with Carlos Castresana, the former prosecutor in the Pinochet case, a Spanish prosecutor, uh, an FBI um, delegate, I work with serious people. Uh, so we try to work with people who know more about myself, about the business of how these guys move. And we started to collect case files, judicial case files. We have collected in the past 11 years more than 2,000 case files, some of them with a team with Carlos, and in nine, between 80 and 92 percent of those case files, you find corruption, political corruption, not police corruption, political corruption linked to organized crime. That's a fact. And we can show you. Now, most of those political corruption cases, between 80 and 92 percent of the case files, depending on the region, are never investigated by the police or by prosecutors because they're blocked. Even if you have a very honest prosecutor, the prosecutor would tell you, we're getting killed. If we investigate this, I have to run away from the country. Like many scholars, like many journalists had to run away from the country, from Mexico. Well, prosecutors do not investigate because they don't have a dead wish in general. So all those cases, now we can pinpoint where the corruption is through those case files. 
When we pinpoint that corruption, then I send my teams to do a visual. But we don't ask questions. We don't go to Sinaloa to say, hey, where is the organized crime? So we just go and we take a look at open and notorious infrastructure that we can see. So much we can see it that in Mexico City, when I was challenged once and told, oh, you don't have the data, I went on radio and I told on radio to a very famous journalist who works for CNN, go to such and such corner and you will find human trafficking of kids. And the mayor is to blame for that. And literally they had to go because I was announcing this publicly as an example that I had the data. Remember this in 2010, you were in Mexico. And um, the police had to go. And they found more than 60 kids who were subject to human trafficking, labor exploitation. So for those people like myself who get out of a chair, out of our offices, and we go and we check the facts, this is not quantum physics. You can find these guys. You should avoid asking too many questions, of course. First, you need to have access to the case files that help you to find out where the most frequent political corruption is. And then you send your people, and I go myself. I, I was in Sinaloa two weeks ago, and I was there uh, with very elegant entrepreneurs, and very elegant politicians, and I was asking them questions. They invited me to wonderful meet. And then I start going around with my team to find out how that infrastructure has grown. The Sinaloa network is becoming more powerful than ever since um, 2012. We can go into that if you like. But the fact is that you can find these facts. And, um, in, and if you want to know, between 2004 and 2012, the percentage of uh, Mexican municipal governments where you found these corrupt linkages that you were asking about went from 63% to 72%. So 72% of more than 2,000 municipal governments, there are 2,512 uh, municipal governments, have a uh, clear infiltration that you can actually pinpoint, either through judicial case files and or through physical infrastructure, buildings dedicated to basically human trafficking and drugs. So this is concerning because this um, percent percentage is going up. Because what, what we need to do is to see the evolution of this. Now, most of the scholars in Mexico who are being paid by different governments, and those are 9 out of 10, I'm sorry to say that. And clearly, Carlos is not one, that's why you have to run away at some point. And, you know, and the point is that most of them will tell you there's no data. We're making up the data. This is not true. I, I, we, we've been warning about this for eight years by now on CNN, on radio, in books. We wrote a book in 2005, a book 400 pages with four co-authors, warning that the system was going to collapse. And denial, denial, and of course, money explains a lot of the denial among academics and among business people and among union leaders. So I hope I'm answering your question. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I have a number of other questions, but I just have to take you up on that uh, about Sinaloa because uh, a lot of you would remember that it's not too long ago that uh, Chapo Guzman, the sort of uh, methodological leader of the Mexican uh, Sinaloa cartel, the presumably most powerful, was captured. And then there was a lot of celebration and the ideas that this would dismantle uh, organized crime in Sinaloa. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about what happened actually? Um, Sinaloa is, uh, is a criminal network that, uh, based on uh, financial intelligence reports and reports by uh, the European Union police that came out with a report a few years ago, two years ago, is present in 59 countries around the world. So you will hardly be able to fight this network just in Mexico, it's far beyond Mexico, and it's involved in 23 types of economic crimes. Drugs is just one of the 23, just to give you an idea of the multinational um, scope of this uh, network. Now, um, Guzman Loera, uh, Chapo Guzman, like you mentioned, was an operational leader of the institution, of that uh, institution. It is an institution. I mean, I didn't want to. It is an institution in Mexico and beyond. 
But let me tell you how this networks uh, work, uh, because otherwise we may come up with a caricature. Sinaloa doesn't have uh, Mexicans all over the world. They work through strategic and tactical alliances with local groups. I'm sure they have some group in Norway from some we don't want to prejudge, but I'm sure they do have some linkages where um, smuggling or some degree of economic crime is linked to something that Sinaloa does in Europe. Mostly, I mean, there, I haven't seen one with Norway, but I've seen Swedes. Swedish uh, organized crime, drugs, Sinaloa linked to Germany. So you do see all these networks, but they work with local groups in all these countries. Uh, they work with franchises, like, uh, you know, like the franchises you see on the street, but they have also their franchises. Now, the Sinaloa network is composed of franchises at the low level. Those are the people you see in the newspapers. Then you have um, very specialized personnel linked with logistics, transportation, production, processing, security, and money laundering and economic uh, infiltration. Then above, you have managers. Then above, you have El Chapo Guzman. But then you have a board. Now, like any business, they have a board. And I will give you a real case to get a sense very fast of how the board works. Once upon a time, in Guatemala, in El Salvador, uh, you had a very powerful um, cartel bringing j drugs from Colombia into Mexico and then to the US and Europe. Now, one of the main money launderers of uh, that uh, cartel was, um, uh, his name was Jose Armando Liort. And Jose Armando Liort was a very a guy with Guatemalan and El Salvadorian uh, nationalities, and he became the main, and this is not by chance, the main source of political campaign financing for the president of Guatemala, whose name was Alfonso Portillo. Now, Alfonso Portillo had no better idea than to appoint him as the president of the Banco Hipotecario Nacional. So he was the president, Jose Armando Llor, of the main bank of El Salvador. Now, I don't have to tell you what he did uh, with the money that he was just um, generating from drugs. He started to channel that money through the main official state bank in El Salvador. And through that money, he took it anywhere, Europe, Asia. It was clean by definition after it went through that bank. Now, uh, all the acts of corruption of Alfonso Portillo after that, because he was involved, were going through the same bank accounts to launder that money, to clean up that money. That criminal network was composed by seven people. One of them was the president of a country. The second was the main president of a bank of that country. And then you had, below them, below these two guys, the Chapo Guzman, whose name was Byron Berganza, who was a DEA informer. That's why the other two guys fell, and we know about this case. By the way, the president was sentenced. And the same thing went for Jose Armando Liort. So these criminal networks always have politicians. May not be the presidents, like in this case, but for sure you will find ministers, you will find governors, you will find always a board of directors involved in the thing. And the same thing in Russia, the same thing in China, the same thing everywhere I've been. And we have been working in 109 countries with teams like Carlos with me. So this is a common denominator. You will never hear this for many reasons. Once because, first, because it's very hard to reach those guys. In this case, we have the luck of having the Chapo Guzman being the informer of the DEA, in which case he was offering information and recordings and pictures of his meetings with the main banker of El Salvador. But most, most of the times we're not that lucky. Uh, especially we're not that lucky, those of us who study this from an academic standpoint. We don't have so much rich data. So uh, usually we only reach, reach the Byron Berganzas in the best case scenario. So those are the Chapo Guzmans. Thank you. Um, since you mentioned that, uh, that in most cases you don't have, uh, a, well, in one case, at least, no, it went up to the presidential level. I've been very cu curious over the last weeks. There's been a lot of discussion about the linkages at the municipal level and also at the state level in, in Mexico. But what about the government or governmental uh, federal institutions? 
uh, could this whole network that uh, Abarca was creating in, in Guerrero, could this have happened without any knowledge at the federal level? It's impossible. Uh, you have Abarca, uh, the first, uh, by training, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a law and economics scholar at Columbia University in New York, so usually I'm, uh, I'm completely obsessed about economic linkages. Uh, whenever a crime occurs, I cry the deaths of the human beings, like I do with 40, 43 kids, uh, but then immediately I go for the economic motivation and I start looking what happened around Abarca. Abarca was the owner with his family of a huge shopping center built on a piece of land that belonged to the 27th Battalion that was just across the street where these kids were kidnapped. Now, let me repeat this. This is a commercial center in the hands of a mayor whose source of money is completely unknown, and his wife and his uh, zoo that he has around. And the land where he built that private commercial center that he's the owner is donated, in quotes, by the 27th Battalion of the Mexican Army. I have seen these guys in pictures, like brothers, uh, many times, the colonel in charge of that battalion. Now, I'm not saying that the colonel is a member of organized crime. I cannot say that. I don't, I'm not a judge. I'm not a prosecutor. But if I were a prosecutor, and we train prosecutors, that's what I do too, I would just open a line of investigation immediately, immediately, because I have economic links between that colonel, the 27th Battalion, that, by the way, never appeared while these kids were kidnapped and disappeared, like other 27,000 people, like my colleague just said, and that 27th Battalion never appeared. This took place, let me tell you, this is a square with the center and the battalion is just 20 meters away. I'm not talking about two kilometers, just you can see it, they're next to each other. And the army never appeared where all these guys were being kidnapped. Now I will start an investigation involving the Mexican army I'm not saying that the entire Mexican army is involved in this, because this is the main cancer when you have a criminal state penetrated by organized crime. Pieces of the state are used by organized crime to conduct their business. So the left-hand side of the state doesn't know what the right-hand side is doing. So you have the 27th Battalion, you have the mayor of the city, you have huge amounts of money, in that commercial center. So I would, and this mayor was going to be a federal deputy next year. Now I will, I, I want to know who are the sponsors, the godfathers. You know why I know he was going to be the federal deputy? Because contrary to Norway, in Mexico, if you are my friend and I'm the regional chief of a party, I can include your name in the list without any voting, without any popular support, and then that list goes to the general elections. So it's very easy to include, to include criminals in electoral lists in Mexico, and criminals become politicians in 24 hours. So this Abarca was going to be a federal deputy next year. So he has a whole network of federal politicians supporting his candidacy. Who are those politicians? Where was he getting the money from? Those are the questions that a Norwegian prosecutor asks whenever a case like this happens. The questions that I'm asking. And a Norwegian prosecutor is allowed to work so that he can get the answers. Now, a Mexican prosecutor would be killed immediately if he tries to go into an investigation of the 27th Battalion and of the federal politicians who were um, bringing this guy to Mexico City next year as a federal deputy. So the answer is quite precise in, the, in his case. Before leaving you, I would just last, like to ask you one final question. Um, you've published your research over uh, several years, and last year you published a book called Vacíos de Poder in Mexico on the, the, um, the vacuums of power in Mexico. And that was well published, there were several interviews in the press. What was the reaction by, uh, could you explain a little bit about the argument there and also what was the reaction by the Mexican authorities? Because it's a very clear and constructive critique. Well, the Mexican authorities are extremely elegant and very polite. I mean, they invite you and they, um, they invite you, the Attorney General invited me for lunch for four hours and I was talking with him, a very polite man. And he had my book uh, underlined and commented. 
So I said to him, why don't we start applying measure number one? You know, chapter five has 26 measures. Why do we start with number one? Well, number one is difficult. Okay, let's say number five. <laughs> well, well, number seven, okay, number seven. Finally, one action, one measure was agreed upon. And we were able to, and um, again, I don't doubt his honesty. I mean, it's not, I mean this is not a vendetta against Peter or, or Juan. The fact is that this guy cannot move because even when he wanted to go with my measure and he proposed it, and we had written proof that he was doing it, that he wanted to apply my uh, proposal of establishing an, an economic investigative unit. That, by the way, it's a state vacuum. They don't have economic investigative units in Mexico. I'm not joking. In, in, the, in the states, they don't have them. So they have a financial intelligence unit at the federal level only for the financial sector. But anything that is non-financial, blank, state vacuum, vacío de poder. So he said, let's go ahead. But when he brought it to the cabinet, it was blocked. So all those letters and preparations went down the drain. So uh, that's the reaction that they have. Uh, very positive. No one came and said, that's not true. Um, but uh, one would hope that some of those 26 measures that we propose at the end, in the last chapter, that are all state vacuums, uh, what, a few of them could be implemented by now. Uh, again, this is not quantum physics. Those measures are not based on what Buscalia thinks. Mexico signed and ratified a United Nations Convention Against Organized Crime. Those 26 measures that I include in my book are an obligation of the Mexican state. It's not an option that the Mexican state has. They have to implement those measures. What I did is to bring them down to earth, to give them names, laws, and things of that sort. So it's not an option, and I tell this to the Mexican ambassador in this country, it's not an option, it's not my opinion. When a state ratifies, I know that there is very little state left in Mexico, but when a state ratifies, a convention, a United Nations convention, it is forced to implement. So that's where my measures come from. Thank you. Uh, to go a little bit uh, back to the, the case of the, the missing students in Ayotzinapa, uh, uh, the, the parents and uh, the supporters of the students seem not to buy uh, the, uh, the version of what has happened uh, that is presented by the, the general prosecutor and, and the government. Um, what, what is, why do they, dis well, we've heard a lot here, so it might be obvious, but why do they distrust the government so much and what do they think have happened? What should the government do to make them uh, sort of please? Well, um, <clears throat> they, they distrust the government first and foremost because they know the government. I mean, they know the, amount, the, the lies, the corruption, their, their, its own involvement in the case. So just from the, the get-go, um, they have no reason actually to trust the government. Uh, second of all, the, the explanations or the theories or what the government has, has done from the very beginning have um, have changed, have been inconsistent, have you know have not gelled. I mean, right? It, the fact that they started off by trying to, to blame the students themselves for organized crime. I mean, that gives you an idea of, of, of why why they wouldn't trust them. This very latest theory that the um, um, that the, the that the, the the bodies were were burned for you know 14 hours in in, in that dump near there. Is, is full of inconsistencies um, and has that has been and has been analyzed by, by experts on this. I mean, I'll just just name a couple. One one is that it, it was raining for the 14 hours for which they they were being burned. So so how do you sustain a fire in that way? I mean, they involve really grisly things. And and experts have also said you know to to burn the bodies to that extent to to uh, you know to have bones disintegrate, teeth disintegrate, as kind of um, described. The, the amount of tires you even need per body to burn is not consistent with what was found there. So, so they're just the, the sheer inconsistencies too that the experts have pointed out. Um, um, and finally, the, the students want to know 
why the, the government right away uh, started searching for bodies, right, instead of searching for students, for, 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 for live uh, uh, people. And that's, that's what has been their demand, um, is why aren't, you, know, we, we, you took them alive, you, you bring them back alive. And, um, and the fact that, that the government has been so inconsistent, has been nine, uh, seems to point to, to, to many of us, not just the, the people involved, that, that, that at, at best they're negligent, at worst they have something uh, deeper to hide. A lot of people are asking about the strategy of the, the Mexican government towards uh, organized crime. We've heard that that is a bit of an odd question, considering all that you've told us, uh, since they might be deeply involved in organized crime. But could you describe a little bit, how, have there been changes over the last year in the way they've handled it, and how would you describe those changes? Yes, we need to say totally. I mean, the, I would say that, um, generally speaking, there have not been strong changes. It's actually, very similar, the current strategy is very similar to the, that one that implemented the Calderon government. I would say that uh, mostly what has changed is the publicity of these issues. Uh, it's, it was very interesting that President Calderon they asked people to talk good about Mexico and he was always talking about security issues. In the case of uh, President Peña Nieto, He's not uh, talking about uh, security issues, but uh, there are still paramount criminality around the country. Um, what happens is that the media uh, has run back to present them, but the strategy is quite the same. I mean, uh, um, you still see that uh, focus on uh, enforcing police institutions instead of prosecuting the actual uh, uh, um, people who reproduce the system, they mostly consider that they can still draw some legitimacy uh, arresting symbolic people, like Edgar Edgar mentioned. I mean, what, is, uh, 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 what doesn't make any sense is to focus in on El Chapo instead of dismantling the system that reproduces Chapo's times after time, time after time. Thank you. And as I mentioned, you can just raise your hands. So I'll continue to ask questions, but just raise your hands if there's something that you want to intervene with. Oh, here we go. Okay. okay. I'm just going to ask you one more question. I have you both on the list. Um, I would just like to ask you, uh, Edgardo, one final question. Um, we see a lot of unrest now. We see a s sort of civil society movement, uh, but uh, one that it's hard to pinpoint what's, what's the leader, who's the, are there any leaders, where is it going? Um, could you just say what, what do you think will happen in the coming months in Mexico? Do you see a potential in the civil society movement that has risen recently? Well, all, all great movements that we admire as, uh, as human beings, uh, Mandela, Mandela, uh, King, uh, Gandhi, they all are movements that were generated by huge uh, human suffering. Um, those movements never come from normal circumstances. They always come from human suffering. But that suffering is already taking place in Mexico. Things could become worse. Why? Because I know where this is going. If nothing is, I know because I've seen it in other countries, not because I have a crystal ball. I've seen it in other countries. How violence evolves into, one of our colleagues was talking about Libya today. Uh, the fact is that Mexican civil society has started to react, and that's positive. Now, in, in the past, civil society has reacted with marches and with white sheets and many movements that were later on uh, dismantled through uh, terror, state terror, uh, or uh, bought by uh, corrupt civil society leaders. Uh, we hope that this is not going to take place now. The difference, I guess, in Ayotzinapa, and I leave that to the knowledge of my, she knows more about Ayotzinapa than I do, is uh, my colleague uh, was speaking 
very thoroughly about this. I said, in Ayotzinapa, this, uh, this young people belong to an old organization. They were well wired. They had contacts. So they were not any victims. Um, they, they were special in many ways. They had contacts to international journalists. They had contacts to national journalists. They had contacts to the guerrilla. Uh, so they are, being, they are organizing better than in previous occasions. And the fact is that 24 hours ago, one of the main leaders, one of the main student leaders, uh, who is a survivor of this uh, crime against humanity, called for national unity in Mexico to establish one movement. Those, that's music to my ears. That's one of the main steps. Now, that movement needs to have an action plan. They need to have a proposal, because if they don't have a proposal, if they just go on the street, a movement without a proposal wanders around, translates into violence, repression by the governments, so a proposal is needed. And then, and I don't want to underscore this, uh, it is essential, based on the experience of Colombia, Indonesia, Italy, the international pressure, the international presses. It is okay for Norway to make money in Mexico, but if you just go there to make money, everyone will be, be worse off. Norway will be doing business with criminals, and I will give you a, a reference for you to read. I'm, I'm an academic, so I will give you references for you to read. Norway will be doing business with criminals within the energy sector, and Norway will be worse off because you will be exposed to violence that you've never seen before, more kidnappings, more extortions, and the Mexicans will be worse off. So you need to have an international pressure of the kind that you saw in Colombia, where the European Union spoke with one voice. The ambassadors of the European Union were every single day before the president and the Colombian ministers expressing their pressure and also constructive technical assistance to help the Colombians. The same thing has to happen here. This, Mexican civil society cannot do this by themselves. They're fighting one of the most powerful organized crime networks in the world, and there's no way to fight organized crime with a, a disorganized civil society. I mean, it, it is very important to see the presence, to feel the presence of Norway and the European Union right away. Uh, and if those three elements are present, then this movement will translate into a Colombia, into a Italy, where far from being a paradise, both countries, things have improved. Colombia and Italy, they have come out of the nightmare that we've seen in Colombia in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. So there is a way out, but these elements have to be there. Thank you. And then I'll start to uh, take a question. Thank you. I have two there first, and then I'll allow you. Uh, microphone? <laughs> Just a second. Thank you for a, a very interesting and uh, challenging, actually, discussion. I have a question that I suppose it goes more down. My name is Marit Mendes. So I'm a social anthropologist, just so you know where I'm coming from. My question has to do, in a sense, with the matter of, of the details, because the picture that at least our two gentlemen are presenting is that, in a sense, there there is one criminal organization and it's infiltrating at all levels. And I'm wondering whether the reality is, is that, is, I mean, is, is there any, you speak of the competition between the, 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 the organization for pieces of the state and I'm wondering what are these pieces of the state and what are they competing for and why, you know, where, at what level are their openings? Because in a sense, the picture you give is so grim that I, I'm trying to get you to say something about, is there no space for a, a, some kind of, of uh, movement opening? And I think the case of, of Guerrero, what's going on there, seems to show that there's something different going on. So that, that 
That would be uh, one question that I would like you to comment on. And the other is, in a sense, how does the whole situation in Chiapas figure into this uh, idea of the organized crime and what's going on with, with, with the movement in Chiapas? Is this kind of isolated and apart from the rest of the state of Mexico? Or, or you know, how do, how does, how do all... Mexico is so big, there's so much going on, and I, I don't... I just don't want to accept that there's, you know, <laughs> there is no other things going on except organized crime and the state. Thank you. Maybe uh, Tanalis could answer the last question first about the relationship with the, what's going on in Chiapas, and then you can start to think about something, some opening, some positive <laughs> features. Yeah, Chiapas has been um, incredibly, incredibly significant for, uh, for, for recent Mexican history um, for many reasons. I mean, I, I, I think in terms of, if, if Ayotzinapa is a moment now, a significant moment, and I think we agree it is, and we'll see how significant, given how much time passes if the moment continues, Chiapas was definitely uh, that um, in 94. And, and the, the, the struggle of the Zapatistas pointed out what, what many in, in, in Mexico were aware of, but pointed it out for the rest of the, the, those of Mexico who were not and the rest of the world to see, and that is the extreme contradictions and illegality of what the, uh, the Mexican government was carrying out with the dismantling of the national project of, of the revolution. And they have been an incredibly um, a sort of moral compass uh, for th for the nation, and um, and in and committed to, um, to to the to the rights and the demands that they have made. So I, I mean, unfortunately, and especially since two thousand and six, they um, they have lost a lot of the attention that the international and the national community uh, previously gave to them, and they, they themselves have have discussed how they feel abandoned by people who were once their allies and and stood in solidarity with them. But I think people uh, from below, people on the ground, know and understand that the hope doesn't lie with the state. Um, or, or political groups. It's it's um, they're so not, not only are they so thoroughly corrupt, but it's not in their interest to fix the problem. They've been they've been creating this situation to promote their own interests to create an, a huge amount of profits. So 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 the students turn to them in, in, in part uh, because of that. So I, I think what is what is really significant and to, uh, to a certain extent hopeful about the fact that the students of Ayotzinapa have gone to Chiapas and, 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 um, and, and the Zapatistas have declared their solidarity with them, is that how do you have a, a movement that actually changes something in Mexico is when, when, you, when it's a national movement, or at least a significant portion of the national movement, and you have people, uh, uh, the, the population more generally, uh, pressuring the government to, to, um, to change. And I think that's what you have in Chiapas, and that is hopeful. And um, uh, uh, Subcommander Moises, in, in, um, in, in declaring his, uh, um, his support for the students, said, said to the students of Ayatunapa, remember, of every 100 people who are now supporting you, down the line there will only be one of, of every one of those. So you have to keep struggling even when they're not around you. And I think the Zapatistas are speaking from experience in terms of how their public support has dwindled. So and just in that, I think it, it, it's on the one hand hopeful from what we see coming from below. Um, and hopefully this will crystallize into a movement that applies enough pressure. But then if we want to ask ourselves what we can do is that it behooves us to not just keep on the pressure when this issue is hot, but to keep on the pressure when it's no longer glamorous, when it's no longer there. Thank you. And then, um... Thank you so much. Well, certainly we're not trying to depict uh, a, a funny character, nothing like that. I mean, we, uh, we're not talking about every single corner of the Mexican state is part of organized crime. That would be uh, an oversimplifying issues. And it's not like that, but uh, certain circuits seem seem to be. Uh, for instance, when, when we con should consider, when we want to consider what are they fighting for, we should think in terms of what might be the key institutions to uh, um, help the continuity of illicit business, or which are the institutions 
uh, which are able to restrict that kind of business. Most of them are, for instance, the police institutions, the courts, the uh, attorney offices. Um, sometimes, or most of the times, these clashing groups are trying to um, place, to nominate in, that, in those institutions people that are willing to work with them and which also will be uh, restricting or blocking the operations of the competitor. And this kind of situation has brought up a lot of violence. Very often we see, for instance, that uh, uh, security directors in municipalities have been killed because some of them were linked uh, to an organized crime ring and it wa he was killed by their enemies. These kind of things are the lo logic in which this violence grows up. And also uh, in terms of, of Chiapas. When Chiapas movement, I mean, uh, uh, rise up, uh, it was in 1994, and in those years Chiapas was not a relevant point for crossing rocks, because most of these rocks were considered the times in which Amado Carrillo Fuentes were uh, hegemonic within Mexican organized crime, drug trafficking, or people like Juan Garcia Abreu. They didn't cross these rocks from, uh, from the air, crossing borders from, from air. They mostly used airplanes, where uh, short airplanes or, or big jumbo jets like Amado Carrillo used to do. But um, afterwards, now you have what in the, within the institutions, they, they say, there was a, a sort of, of, of um, implicit agreement of not interfering with each other. I mean, now you have much more traffic of cocaine on earth, through ground, uh, on the ground, through Chiapas, but uh, they were not actually uh, um, often crossing the fields where acetylene is dominant. Nevertheless, this is also a, a different situation now because in the case of, of, of uh, Guerrero, this kind of, of, of uh, uh, informal, I mean, it's not like a pact, it's rather that, that I don't touch your interests, you don't touch mine. This, this thing was broken in Guerrero because they fought a, a realm of guerrilla. So things may become much worse in that situation because a new actor may be also really touched and interested in fighting back. So, so you're saying basically that uh, the the Chapatistas, the Zapatista movement in Chiapas would not have occurred, or the, the, the development would not happen the way it did if it were today when where drug routes crossed their territory. Basically, is that what you're saying? And that things are different in Guerrero because it's so dense with different kind of drug trafficking organizations. Well, what I, what I was trying to depict is that in the case of Guerrero, in the state of Guerrero, you have a local production of drugs. But nevertheless, they, these drug uh, traffickers, usual drug traffickers, have been not trying to, uh, to fight the very core of, 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 these, uh, of these movements. For instance, Ayotzinapa, for instance, they have never killed, for instance, people linked with, with uh, Sente, La Sente, no El Sente, it's different. Um, but in, and in the case of Chiapas, you didn't have that state um, being very important in terms of drug trafficking. Now it became more important because with this weak situation of the, of the border, you have um, an increasing uh, quantity of, of charts, of drug charts coming from the ground, you know, on, on, I mean crossing on, on, on ground, and you didn't used to have them before. But nevertheless, these criminal groups are, are not willing to clash against SLN. They are not. They are trying to avoid mixed two. But in the case of Guerrero, this this kind of situation was broken up because of this uh, attack against the Yotzina. Thank you. Not too much on the positive account, but we'll hope we'll, we'll end on that. Then we have uh, there, Luis. Well, my, my question was pretty well answered by, by you guys, uh, but um, I have another question. Uh, it's, it's very interesting for me to see that uh, they just said, well, I've talked to this official and he was looking like a very uh, polite, uh, educated, uh, highly uh, 
uh, you can have higher, you have very very good words about him, right? And then we, we talk about basically help, right? So so what I mean when I talk about Mexico, we think everything is going on, and uh, me as a Mexican, right, living here in Norway, being the best country to live, and if I compare that 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 life with what I had in Mexico, which was even though not that bad, but uh, but still, you know, I, the, the the people that I'm most afraid of in Mexico is the police. You know, I see a police, I'm scared because I know that there's going to be problems there. When I see a policeman in Norway, it's not the case. But well, that's not the point. The point is that I uh, do. You see any changes in this divide of uh, of the country? I mean, where there's this uh, uh, this educated people or this uh, um, this very uh, ver vertical difference between between the the rich or the or the um, I don't know how to say it, the, the elite and the, and, the, and the general population. Is there, has been, uh, I mean, my, my notion is that, you know, this, this communication uh, that we have now, the, the leveling of, of, of making it more horizontal, has made, has made people aware more of the others. Uh, and, and I think that's something very important. But, uh, but you know, I am not, I'm, I'm not living there for a while. And, uh, and I also don't have the, the historical perspective on that. So I think you, you, your, your opinion on that will be very enriching. Uh, thank you. I, I, will, <clears throat> I will try to answer uh, the two questions uh, at the same time because I didn't have the chance to. Uh, I'm not um, I'm a specialist, uh, so I, I haven't brought, I'm not here to talk about climate change. Uh, in, in, and if you look at Mexico's um, public policies on climate change, uh, I was talking to the chief delegate of the German government traveling with me to, to Mexico by chance. We started to talk, we talk, and she was telling me that Mexico's proposals are equal in level to Germans or to any other. So in those areas where organized crime doesn't have a stake, uh, usually you will see that the Mexican state is quite schizophrenic. You have very advanced uh, degrees of public policies in many areas. I was brought here to talk about human security. And human security is your right in Norway to access 58 goods and services that the state is supposed to produce. Uh, not because I say so, it's because there are 16 United Nations conventions that say so. So in that regard, human security in Mexico is going down the drain. And, uh, and I understand that people here may see, I mean, from a beautiful country like Norway, uh, I would also think that most of the world is quite grim, uh, especially from a country where public ethics uh, you know, has a chance to determine public policies like Norway. Most of the world doesn't work like that. So it looks grim. Well, Mexico looks especially grim. And by now, I don't have to convince you, because eight years ago, I would have expected this amount of amazement to what we're saying on Mexico. By now, with 60 mass graves in Durango, 30 mass graves in Tamaulipas, several in Guerrero, and I can keep counting mass graves, I don't think that I have to come here to convince you that the situation in Mexico is not a human disaster. It is from a human security standpoint, and we have to face it. Yes, it is hell. It is hell, and we have to face hell, and we have to recover Mexico society as a community of nations, and as a community of societies, and not just look the other way, saying, well, things may not be that bad. You know, it is bad. You have competing organized crime groups capturing police, municipal police and state police, and using that police to protect their drug cargoes and to protect their buildings and to kill, like Carlos said, many other state officials that work for the opposite organized crime group. And that's very common. I can just go, go to any newspaper, in anyone who speaks Spanish, you can just search and you will, f you will see many frequent shootings among state authorities and federal authorities municipal authorities and federal authorities. Pieces of the state shooting at other pieces of the state. So I don't, I'm not, we're not making up this story. By now it's quite obvious that this is the case. So it is a disaster. Like Colombia was a disaster and it came back. Now the most optimistic message I can leave here is that if those three conditions 
do apply, like in Colombia and Italy, Mexico will come back. Mexico will improve. So this is not a weather phenomenon. It's, it's not an inevitable, you know, uh, weather. It's not a storm, a hurricane. It, we can do something about it. And we know what to do. And we have United Nations conventions signed with the articles stating what to do. So this is the most optimistic message that anyone can leave. So we're not subject to some unknown phenomena that we have no knowledge about. Thank you. Then I have a couple of questions here. And I'll take it. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I came here first to listen, um, but I came here also to say something, to make a statement. People, uh, you were talking about uh, why all of a sudden people rise up. And uh, I, I will tell you the version of a 50-year-old man with two, with two sons in Mexico. I rise up because I think, what if it was my kids? What if the, one of those 43 had been one of mine? And that thought made me wake up and made me come here and made me make a statement. I don't know. I have no idea if my statement is going to be of any help. And I don't, I really don't care who's guilty of abducting these people, who's guilty of pulling the trigger. What I'm interested in is who is responsible. Because people who said that they would take responsibility for this country, they're not doing it. And I would like to see responsible people. Thank you. Now, but uh, I have something to to ask you. Um, this uh, situation has been for several decades, so it's not new. What's happened? What's going on in Mexico now? What happened? Why is provoked this situation? It's because the people they don't accept anymore the repression of these crimes, or, or what is going on in Mexico? Is it also a political issue, or is in fact? the people who, who react against it. And how, what well, is going to happen afterwards? I mean, certainly this is not new. There was a sort of, a, of a administration of crime by a power that was also part of that uh, criminal rings. I mean, in the case of Mexico, we cannot say that the organized crime grew up alone uh, uh, autonomously from the state, it it grew up very very close or under the eyes of the state, of the state actors probably uh, that may be more uh, accurate, which obtained the regular money from them. Nevertheless, uh, after this uh, uh, change in terms of political regime, when this regime, but from decentralization to a more fragmented condition that I was talking about before. What you have is a um, corruption desinstitutionalizada, desinstitutionalized corruption instead of that institutional corruption, which is more or less well organized. Now, with this kind of, of, of um, crazy issues that we're watching, like this, this massacre, I think that it touched a nerve in Mexican society because we have a sad story of uh, students' repression. We have already watched in, in, in 1968, in 1971, a history of students who were uh, not involved in any, any irregular issue, which were harshly repressed. And I think that it brings up a lot of memories to Mexican society that says enough is enough. We cannot stand any more this this anymore. 
was a student. And they would, I'm sorry, can I ask another thing? Okay. Very short. Uh, uh, Professor, you were speaking about the economy. Uh, I always I have been thinking that the economics is more powerful now than the poli politics. But uh, I have a question, very concrete. Uh, what's going, what do you believe that is going to happen in Mexico with the open uh, foreign investment now from many countries which uh, are invited, to say that like that, to invest in Mexico? What's going on? Because also, what happened with the national resources of the Mexican uh, country? What happened with the sovereignty? What is going to happen with the politics also? Are we going to be more dependent on foreign uh, uh, countries? And, uh, and are we going to miss the sovereignty, maybe? And uh, the, the organized crime is going to be stronger because they have also infiltrated in the state a lot of, of personnel and, and, and uh, resources. They finance, finance also political campaigns and many things like that. So, what do you think that is going to happen? Some of those issues might be a bit on the side, but some are very related to to what we're discussing here. So, perhaps you could answer. I, I'm not an energy sector expert, but I can tell you that usually in countries like Nigeria, in the Delta region, uh, where when organized crime violence goes up, and you have oil companies going there, they face exponential higher costs because of that. Higher kidnappings, higher extortions. So it's not good business for Norway or for any other oil company to go into an area where it's... I mean, if you want to read a very good book about this topic, uh, there's a book uh, titled um, El Cartel Negro. El Cartel Negro is a book written by Ana Emilia Perez. And she documents uh, all, the, uh, all the infiltration of organized crime in Pemex. Uh, Petróleos Mexicanos, with documents, uh, all the sub, uh, all the companies that work for Pemex, how they penetrate those companies, how they kidnap, extort, corrupt, and it's all documented. So you see the judicial cases, you see how American and Canadian businesses, legal businesses, buy the, the they buy the oil from organized crime in Mexico how the Americans sell that oil within the U.S. is a fantastic book. I would read it. Uh, if one thing I want to leave here today is a sense that this is documented. This is not just opinions. It's well documented. And that book will answer many of your questions. Uh, Ana Lilia Perez, El Cartel Negro. By the way, Ana Lilia had to run away from Mexico, of course, because she wrote this wonderful book. She was hiding in Germany. For, in Hamburg for three years, and she was there hiding from the Mexican authorities. She was being not threatened by external, by Mexican authorities, by a senator and by members of the Navy intelligence. And she was protected by the German government, not by the Chinese government, by the Germans. Next, next year. She was three years hiding in Hamburg. So this is the reality of Mexico right now for anyone who wants to write a book answering your questions. She is the expert on oil and organized crime. And um, uh, regarding the future of that beautiful country, Mexico, you will still have the beautiful pyramids, the beautiful culture, the beautiful civilization. Uh, Mexico is a cradle, is one of the main cradles of civilization in this world. No one, no one will take that away from Mexico like no one will take that away from Iraq. However, organized crime and wars do damage that heritage. Uh, so we have to take that into account, like we see in Iraq, you know, the destruction that we see. Uh, we do have lots of questions from the audience, and I have one that I'm just burning to ask. Uh, I think we'll do it this way because I see that the, the time is running out. Now, I have three questions here that if you can ask them quickly, and we'll take a round of answers. Uh, there's one there and there and there. Okay. And the one in the back here, I think that will be too much, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Carol. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be quiet, uh, quick. Uh, the thing is, like, it doesn't seem like the answer of the, of the solution to the problem is, go, is going to come from above. Um, and you say that it is any positive thing that it could be 
we could look ahead was uh, if civil society could just unify and try to maintain this movement. And I have to, to uh, say that I am not very optimistic on that issue because Mexico's civil society, or in general, it is my impression that this Mexican civil society is quite divided. Um, I would like to know, um, there are many reasons for it. This is the income inequality, the, you have the south part of Mexico, which is pretty much indigenous, while you have the other part of the country where are cultural different. Uh, you have, you say also that um, maybe what make people fed up with this, with this, uh, with this uh, murder in, in, in Guerrero was that they were students. But that, the problem is that they were students who are, who are going to become teachers. And in the south of Mexico, especially in Oaxaca and other places, it's been a big problem between teachers and, and, civil, and part, other parts of society. So it's been a, a national joke that, oh yeah, are you the teacher, the teacher from Oaxaca or something? The point is, like, I want to know if there is any sort of a network or something that is like trying to canalize all the international efforts to support that point, because I think it will be like the most important thing to do. Do you know about that? About that? Just pass it to the next. Uh, hello. Um, you mentioned that an international effort uh, would be necessary. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, what kind of effort do you envision and what have you seen so far? What's that? Uh, what kind of international response do you envision and what have you seen so far in uh -huh. terms of international uh, government level responses? Can I also draw to, to this and say, you know, just, just to fill up on that uh, question, what is the role of the banking system in Mexico? In what I mean is that there is a large amount, I mean, the main bulk of the financial activity is done by banks that are foreign to Mexico, therefore controllable by the international community. And then you talked about the machinery, you know, the cartel machinery or the corruption machinery. If these people move money, in theory, this is traceable. So what is the international community doing via the banking system to stop this? I would just like to add one question that I know a lot of people are concerned with. Then you, you should have, you, I'll give you your pen back and then you can take notes. And you as well, because I'll give you a round of uh, possibility, or possibility to answer afterwards. But um, you have downplayed a lot the role of drugs as kind of the, the core of the problem, that the core problem is uh, the corruption in the state. But, uh, but drugs evidently plays a role. What would, there's a lot of drug reforms going on in the United States, in Latin America, there are lots of initiatives. What do you think uh, would be the impact of uh, kind of drug reform moving towards the legalization? I would, like, I would like to address the last one that you did. I think that, well, when you are considering all the situation and the historical background of Mexico, you reach a conclusion that uh, rocks did not invent or devise Mexican corruption. It potentiated it. So these uh, perspectives of uh, legalizing some, some consumption or, or, or rolling back penalties of some consumption certainly take off some pressure, but cannot be expected to, to, to shift uh, or to change the whole environment. I mean, I, I, I think that I, I myself a progressist in, in, in respect to that. Nevertheless, if uh, deeper measures are not taken, to clean the, the structure of the state, just uh, this kind of um, uh, of uh, drawing back of penalties are not to, to, to control the, the whole problem. And 
talking about uh, the banking institutions is very interesting because I would say that the current regime of uh, fighting money laundering is not effective anywhere, in, in any place. I mean, if we consider cases like Bakovia, Bashovia, HSBC, we may see that um, it's very interesting that these uh, institutions pay the, how do you say, multi? <laughs> the fee, the time, exactly. But nevertheless, the money they launder is still uh, very impressive and makes uh, a, a sense to pay for that and not having anybody going prosecuted. I think that uh, um, another issue to consider is that I mean the, the international community should uh, uh, consider that uh, hiatus between what it says that uh, promotes and the actual income it may have. Uh, which is irregular. Thank you. Uh, who wants to go next? Okay, I'll, just, I'll just go briefly take about the issue of, of civil society that, that you mentioned being divided. And first, I'm not sure if I completely understood your point about the Oaxacan teachers, but if I understood correctly, um, or, or, or I want to make a point about teachers in general that, that might be illustrated by the Oaxaca thing you brought up. Uh, like the normalistas themselves, um, who are very much, who have historically been very maligned in the press precisely because of their, their activism and accused of being um, subversives or, or just um, um, disrupting the order as opposed to just doing what they should do, which is go study. Um, teachers have been similarly um, maligned and in, in that way blamed for the educational problems in Mexico which of course have a lot deeper root, uh, uh, roots and structural problems and so one of the ways the government has sought to address that is by saying that um, or they should be higher standards, higher testing, all of that. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't bad teachers or bad teachers in Mexico like there are bad teachers everywhere but by singling them out and pointing to that as a problem that the government has sought to dismiss its own responsibility and lack of, of public education, and 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 um, and one of the way, but teachers have also been very militant in, in their struggles, and one of those uh, powerful struggles have been in Oaxaca um, in 2006. But really quick about civil society divided, uh, yeah, in general, it, it seems that um, I mean there has been a lot of discontent by diff and different groups have manifested it in different ways throughout Mexico, and one of the ways. Uh, social change happened at a national level is when some event happens that unifies or that brings all of these groups that have been discontent or that, um, that brings them together. And that doesn't uh, mean that the entire nation is going to come together. No way. Change is never brought about by the absolute majority. It's brought about by a significant and persistent and powerful uh, group. And so those issues of being divided by class, by region, by ethnicity, I think what there's actually more that unifies them, that divides them, and that, that they are e excluded or oppressed um, or brutalized in different ways and have been harmed by an economic system that has been imposed in, in an undemocratic way. And if they can, if they can have enough alliances among those, uh, those lines of discontent, there's a possibility that a movement for change can be uh, created. I'll give you the final word. Yeah, three. I have three questions first, so I'll, I'll try to shorten. Uh, the first one is the uh, examples of, uh, of an international cooperation where 28 countries around the world, according to Amnesty International, when um, those countries um, experience a collapse of the judicial system, like the one that Carlos has shown with numbers, uh, where the judicial system doesn't work, uh, they um, immediately have um, approach uh, what we call truth commissions. In other words, um, mechanisms through which civil society with technical cooperation from the United Nations, the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, establishes a commission composed of civil society members who are approved not by the government but by the victims and the families of victims for each case. So you need to have one for Ayotzinapa, another one for San Fernando Tamaulipas, another one for uh, the Durango, common gra mass graves, and in each truth commission, the commission gathers evidence, gathers testimony, with the technical assistance of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, the United Nations. Now, the international community is key to protect those members, to protect them, 
not, all, not with guns, but to protect them with the presence of the United Nations around them so they can work and gather those testimonies. That's key in 28 countries, Cambodia, South Africa, Argentina, Bolivia, I mean, those, as a, so that's very, and Norway has experience in providing technical assistance for uh, truth commissions in Colombia. So that would be one international uh, measure that I would recommend immediately, especially for Ayotzinapa. Do not let Ayotzinapa fall into the hands of the Inter-American Court for Human Rights. That's a political body controlled by the Mexican government. So they're very happy to see that now the families of Ayotzinapa have been surrounded by members of that court because the Mexican government can control the outcome there. Take them to truth commissions uh, and Norway can provide technical assistance. Now the issue of money, uh, my next book is about money laundering and political corruption. So that, that, that will be a beautiful, I mean, I'm gonna give you a preview right now. Now look, uh, Mexico is actually, the banks in Mexico are very few. There are seven or eight banks that have an oligopoly. Very few banks. Uh, that's one of the sectors that I call uh, politically controlled uh, oligopolistic sectors. So it sounds very fancy, but those are economic sectors where foreign investors come. They shake hands with very powerful people, president or a minister, and they enjoy amazing rates of return. Banco Santander, for example, has rates of return three, four times what they earn in Spain, in Mexico. Now, those guys do not, uh, will, will not put all that money at stake by involving themselves with organized crime directly. But the most important, so they, they, the Mexican banks are complying much more than before with the 40 recommendations of the Financial Action Task Force. Those are 40 recommendations that governments around the world have developed to prevent money laundering. So Mexican banks are doing better than before. Now, the, the work by F Professor Friedrich Schneider and a professor, uh, her name is Beatrice Unga, both professors separately have uh, shown that between 65 and 68 percent of the money laundering worldwide goes to those countries with the most sophisticated rule of law. Now, why is that? Why is it that money laundering is integrated into the economies and the legal systems of the most advanced uh, societies that we admire for the rule of law? It's very simple, because if I'm a member of that board, of an organized crime, I am the first one to look for the rule of law to protect my money. I will not invest that money in Argentina or in Afghanistan, I will invest it in countries where my property is protected. Of course, they do it after many, 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 many transactions. It's very hard for an Austrian prosecutor to trace back three, four hundred transactions, the money, all the way back to the crime in Mexico. So they have very sophisticated advisors who hide that money through an incredible architecture. In my book, I will show some examples of how they design the money laundering, so it goes into buying bonds in Bulgaria, houses in France, then they buy a business in Dusseldorf, it's incredibly sophisticated. So by the time they integrate their money, the money laundering, and they really clean it, between 65 and 68 percent of all the money laundering in the world goes to uh, 20 countries. And those are the countries of the OECD. The United States concentrates between 18 and 20 percent of the money laundering worldwide. So in terms of money laundering, I would not be that much concerned about what Mexico is doing. I would be much more concerned about what Austria, Sweden, Spain, and all these countries are doing. That is quite little uh, in terms of the tsunami of money that we see coming in. And about drugs, I will have a private conversation later about this with you because, but we wrote a report with 15 people last year as part of the Organization of American States. Organization of American States is a regional body in the Western Hemisphere that gathers all the countries from Canada all the way to Argentina and they produced a, a report on drugs uh, in order to answer the question that um, Benedict just asked, what to do about legalization of drugs. Now the beautiful thing about this report is that I learned a lot from the members because there were doctors, toxicologists, biologists, 
psychologists. So I, I, I was just economist. I learned much more from the rest. So I learned amazing things about the effects of drugs on your body, heroin, marijuana, and everything else. Now, one of the main conclusions of this report, uh, first, the report was not aimed at telling governments what to do. They were basically uh, accounting for all the menu of policies that governments could take into account regarding how to deal with drugs. And one of the main agreements that we have is that by legalizing uh, drugs, so-called legalizing drugs, in other words, regulating psychoactive um, substances, you will not get rid of organized crime. That was one of the main conclusions. <coughs> organized crime is too diversified in so many legal and illegal businesses. We count 23 illegal businesses. Then you have all the legal businesses that are involved. If you think that by legalizing marijuana, cocaine, <coughs> you will get rid of these guys, forget it. That's not going to happen. That was one of the main conclusions. Now, there are countries that are experimenting with regulation of some drugs, and or all drugs, Portugal versus Uruguay with marijuana, so we don't have enough data to find out the effects of those policies on public health. Because at the, at the, at the end of the story, the reason that you are thinking about regulating a psychoactive drug that now is illegal is to improve your public health framework and make sure that people don't die. Well, let me give you one piece of data that came out from our report, and I leave it there because we got to go. Is 60% uh, of the deaths in the United States uh, from overdose of psychoactives is caused by legal drugs, not illegal drugs. Legal. This is according to the Center for Disease Control, the CDC in Atlanta. So uh, it's much more complicated than just, uh, but the conclusion is organized crime will not be um, dismantled by legalizing. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. time. Uh, I'm sure there's ample uh, possibilities for continuing discussions elsewhere. Uh, I would like to thank our three panelists for coming to Norway from England, from Beirut and uh, Italy and from Mexico. I would like to thank our audience. I would just like to mention one little piece of information before you leave. Um, there was a, a small kind of uh, event yesterday uh, in solidarity with all the uh, all the things that were going on in, in Mexico yesterday. I've been informed that on the 26th of um, uh, 26th of November there will be uh, demonstrations or in 40 cities in Europe, in 40 cities in Europe there will be events. Uh, because it marks the two months since the students were uh, disappeared. And uh, I represent the University of Oslo. We don't normally organize these things, but I think there's several people here in the audience that could take up that uh, uh, that initiative and, and make Oslo the 40s, 40 first first <laughs> city where that will happen. But the, the ones who are organizing this is called Libera. Libera is a network of 1,800 civil society organizations in Europe, and we are helping the Mexicans, uh, the Mexican civil society movements from Libera, and Libera is organizing this uh, public demonstration. So go to their website, www.libera.it. Libera will be as important. Okay. Okay. With those words, thanks a lot, and enjoy the rest of your evening.